Turning now to another heady creature question. How do ant queens get crowned? This is a royal mystery because, and this is wild, you can take two ant eggs with exactly the same genes and one can grow up to be a queen and the other a worker. How does that happen? It turns out that's a hot topic in the ant world, and a recent paper provides some insights. Here to tell us more is study author Dr. Daniel Cronauer, an evolutionary biologist at the Rockefeller University in New York City. Daniel, welcome to Science Friday. Thank you very much. You study the social lives of insects. What drew you to this particular anthill? Well, I've been really fascinated by insects since I was a little kid. So I grew up in Germany, in Heidelberg, as you might be able to tell from my accent. And my mom tells the story that she often couldn't find me during elementary school pickup because it turned out that I was punched over in some hedge watching <laughs> ants on the floor or looking at a beetle or something. You know, when you, when you watch insects, they just look very exotic and, and almost like on a different planet or like some, some alien creatures. And for me, that was always very fascinating, like thinking about how they experience the world and how they communicate and what their behavior means to them and how they live. And then I made that early childhood fascination my profession. So your latest study is about how a queen ant becomes a queen, which I take it is kind of mysterious and a little bit of a hot topic in the ant world. Yeah. So the interesting thing is that in an ant colony, you can start with, say, two eggs that are genetically identical. And depending on how you treat those individuals during the larval stage when they're growing up and they feed a lot, they can develop into either a queen, which is very large, lays a ton of eggs lives quite long in some species for decades or you can raise it into a worker which is small usually can't lay eggs or doesn't lay eggs lives only for a few months often and performs all the other tasks in the colony so from one genome you can make very very different types of organisms like stem cells exactly i was about to say right it's a little bit like you start with a stem cell and then you make either say a neuron or a skin cell and that's actually the analogy that you hear a lot when you read about insect societies, the analogy of the insect society as an organism, or sometimes people talk about the superorganism. The superorganism. So do we understand what determines whether that ant egg becomes a queen or a worker? Yeah, so there's a lot of research that's being dedicated to that still, and it has a lot to do with how much food the larva gets. And so the workers can feed a larva more or less food, or they can feed it different types of food. You might have heard of royal jelly in honeybees. So if a larva gets fed a lot of royal jelly, it tends to de develop into a queen. So ultimately, it, it has a lot to do with what size the larva reaches and how large it can grow. But who's determining how much food that larva gets? Like, and are all the larvae getting the same amount of food and some just get bigger than others and become the queen? Yeah, so it's a bit complex, right? Like, I think the simplest scenario is that the workers who feed the larvae, right, they go out, they forage, they bring food back, and then they give the food to the larvae. Those are the ones that kind of decide how much food the larvae get. And so what a lot of ant species do is that they raise new workers or new queens in separate cohorts. So, you know, sometimes in the spring, you see kind of winged ants that kind of fly around. Those are queen ants, the bigger ones. Oh, so you can have multiple queens in a generation. It's not one that's being picked out. No, exactly. So most ant colonies, you know, they have often one queen in the colony that lays the eggs. But when they raise queens, they raise many, many queens, like often hundreds, sometimes thousands. And those queens, they have wings initially, and then they go on a mating flight. Then they mate. Then the males usually die, and the queens shed the wings. And then they start to dig a little hole in the soil, and they found a new colony. And then you have a new colony that has Okay, one. so we know that size is a biggie for determining how that queen program is going to get switched on in an ant. And size is determined by genes and by the environment. But your new study in clonal raider ants shows that it's not that simple, right? Yeah, I would say kind of if you wanted to distill these findings down into kind of one main conclusion... It's that basically what the study shows is that there are genes that affect 
the body size of an individual and therefore the caste phenotype. And then there are genes that affect the relationship between the caste phenotype and the body size. There's basically two different ways to be a queen, right? One is to be larger and one is to have a genotype where queen development sets on at smaller body sizes. And when does this queen program initiate? Like, is it when they're in the larval stage after they've hatched? I mean, when do they know that they're big enough to be queen-like? That's a very good question. And I think there we still have to do a lot of work. There are some ant species where it's determined very, very early during development. You can almost tell at the egg stage. Oh, wow. Uh, and then there's other ant species where it's probably determined pretty late during the larval stage, right? And it really only becomes clear once the larva enters pupation, basically metamorphosis. So there's a lot of diversity in ants, I think. And that's going to be very interesting to, to study more carefully at the developmental level and at the molecular level. I mean, is it good to be the queen? Would you want that if you were an ant? So, yeah, exactly, right? Like you, you think of the queen as the one individual in a colony that has all the power. But in ants, that's not really true, right? Like the queen is basically this individual that just lays eggs and doesn't do much else. I don't know. It's that almost sounds like horrible. A, exactly. Actually. It's almost like an egg laying machine or something. <laughs> so I wouldn't, you know, I, I don't know if I would want to be an ant queen. So I was reading that this is a hot topic in the ant world. Yeah. Tell me why. What's the drama around this? Well, I think it's just a very interesting question, right? It's this extreme case of what people call phenotypic plasticity, right? A lot of developmental biology, evolutionary biology is about this question of what's classically discussed as nature versus nurture, right? right. Like how much of your existence or your phenotype, the way you are, is determined by the genes you inherited and how much is determined by the environment you've experienced, right? Or maybe even chance events. And that's a, it's a really interesting and important question. And I think ants are just very, very well suited to address those questions. Daniel, thanks for talking to me today. Thank you so much for having me.